Hey there, Greg here. Today I'm going to show you how I use sculpting to create the fit of a pottery piece and significantly increase its appeal. This is the second part. In the first episode, I tackled a more technical aspect with the construction of the clay vessel using a slab. If you haven't seen the first part, I'll include the link in the description, but both episodes can be watched independently. I often make sculpted pots, but I showcase few on the channel because it's something special. It's not just about technique to replicate, there's an artistic dimension that you can't learn from a single video. I don't want to make a clickbait video and tell you, hey, watch this video and you'll become a sculpture master. That would be a lie. Some people have artistic sensibility, others don't. It can't be learned, but it takes time and practice. But I'll share my approach, reflexes to acquire, some tips, but I won't turn you into Rodin in one video. So, I'll be sculpting a snake. The most challenging part will be creating a realistic head, and the most tedious will be crafting the texture of its skin, its scales. But actually, it's not a very complicated subject. No arms, fingers, face, complex anatomy. It's a good subject to start this type of sculpture. And in this realm, it's the same as what I've explained in other videos about making a pot. Don't skip steps. Don't try complicated subjects on your first project. Even though a snake may seem simple at first, always take the time to look at models before starting. Don't try to work from your imagination. You generally have an idea of a general shape. A head, eyes, a mouth, easy. But when it comes to sculpting it, will you be spot on with the details? I'll quickly show you that you can't rely on your memory. Okay, let's start with the shape of the head. Is it more oval, elongated, rather flat? Actually, it's rather triangular, with a flat snout for most part. But it depends on the species, hence the importance of researching and knowing what you want to do. Okay, now, where are the eyes located? More towards the back? In the middle? Well, they are more towards the middle, but on the side with large arches. And the nostrils? They should be somewhere around there. Actually, it also depends on the species. Many of them on the side, over on the front. And how big is its mouth? Snakes have a big mouth, so it should easily reach eye level. Actually, it's even bigger, extending to the back of the skull. I won't give you a snake anatomy lesson, but I just want you to realize that you can't work with a prior preparation. You need to observe, see the alignments, size relationships, specific details, and more. Even if your sculpture isn't perfect, these details will make your creation more believable. But feel free to test the from memory version. This is what will make all the difference between a good and a bad sculpture. It's what will make it look like a snake, not a worm with a dog's snout. I see so many people trying to make uh, dragons, for example which end up looking more like a dog or a pig, with questionable anatomy. I'm almost sure they didn't do research, or at least didn't observe their documentation properly. I can guarantee you that all good artists have at least one anatomy book. Just because to accurately reproduce something, 
you need to understand its nature, its working. I'm going to make my snake from a basic shape that I'm going to evolve. I made a pretty big coil, but I know very well that I'm going to have to quickly reduce it. It won't be practical to handle, and the head will end up detaching from the rest. I start by drawing light lines to place landmarks. First, I'm going to mark the axis of symmetry. Because yes, almost all animals have an axis of symmetry. I place some obvious landmarks, like uh, the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth. Once these landmarks are in place, I refine the shape of the head a bit. I mark the eyebrow arches, the shape of the mouth, the placement of the corners. Well, as expected, I'm going to cut the head. I glue it back on the body later. When everything is well placed, I tackle the final details like the scales, which have a particular geometry on the head. It's not a lineup of fish scales. It's time to move on to assembly. Many of you asked me how to get the templates for my pots. For Patreon supporters, the templates are always available for free upon the release of the corresponding video. But if you don't want to become a member, they are now available for download on Gumroad. And if it's something you like, I'll try to add more in the future.
The wooden slats represent the height of the feet. They will help me maintain a good height during the foot assembly process. Off camera, I made several small body pieces to place them all around the pot, making it look like the snake was coiled under the pot and carrying it. It was long and boring. I'll just show you how I texture the scales on the different parts. It's an easy and very creative technique. I gather a lot of small pieces of wood around me. Sticks, disposal cutlery, popsicle sticks. With a bit of imagination, these improvised tools can yield interesting results. Just aligning this basic shape already gives a very interesting scale effect. And with just one chip, there are already many ways to arrange it. Experiment and create your own patterns. Be careful, use wooden pieces or absorbent materials. With plastic, you might get a suction effect. Your tool would stick to the clay and you'd have deformed patterns. Secondly, you can create your own shapes by sculpting these pieces of wood. That's what I did for my scale texture. Be careful on large surfaces. Keeping a nice alignment is tricky. Consider drawing some very light marks to guide you during the work. Et voilà, an incredible effect that only requires a little skill and patience. You've probably seen this kind of pattern from other potters. It's become quite common. I was already making this kind of pottery over 10 years ago. It produces really nice stuff. Hmm, not to myself, make more scale pots. <laughs> Breaking out my oldies made me want to make more. These little bubble levels are easy to find. It's a handy tip for having a level pot, especially when making asymmetrical fit like here. When I do this kind of work, I prefer to wear gloves. Not because it's especially toxic, but iron oxide gets embedded and it's very difficult to wash off. In fact, iron oxide is a fancy name for rust. And you may have already uncounted rust tents. It's particularly stubborn. Before the final firing, I do an initial low temperature biscuit firing and I apply a patina with an iron oxide wash to bring out the details. I'll be back with new pots and new tips.